Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Fridays with Foster. I'm your host, Foster. Hope you all had a great week. Uh, things are getting a little bit colder than they have been in the past. So uh, hopefully if you're watching this from some area that's got uh, snowfall, uh, hope you are safe. I mean, most people are more than ever are staying indoors now anyway. So uh, it might not be as much of a change other than the view through the window. So today uh, I am actually enjoying one of my most favorite coffees. This is a holiday blend by Pete's Coffee, which is awesome and I love it. And that's horrible lighting on that. Anyway, so you can get the, get the gist. Pete's.com uh, is one of my favorites, uh, always has been. I'm just now getting back to it, of course, with my um, uh, with the French press. And so uh, it is uh, a very dark coffee, which I like. So, of course, as we or from the first episode, the darkest coffees don't always have the much as much caffeine or the most caffeine. So I usually drink twice as much, which is okay. Uh, how it tastes, I'll give you the description from their site. Double chocolate, extra fragrant, two Guatemala coffees. Oh, an ultra plush, excuse me. One of the Guatemala coffee, the Guatemala coffees is fruit forward, one chocolate back. I have no idea what that means, but I'm assuming that means you'll taste the fruit first, then the chocolate. I don't know. seems like it's some weird coffee chaser. And it says it is, it is a wash in natural Ethiopia and a sumptuous Sumatra gang up for a hedonistic heavyweight of holiday <laughs> That is significant. Hedonistic coffee. All right. Well, in my uh, Christmas naughty mug, when my wife gets the nice mug, I get the naughty mug. Uh, let's give it a shot. Tastes very hedonistic. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's good. Uh, it's uh, it is bold. Uh, as you know, I always talk about the bitterness. I you know the. Uh, it's not very bitter. I'm just trying to figure out this fruit forward chocolate back thing. Maybe I need, if anybody wants to post on my page someplace I could get some maybe better education about coffee. I know Starbucks was actually, as so much as I dislike Starbucks and corporate coffee. Um, uh, I know they um, uh, had a class or something that you could do online to learn more about coffee. And since it is one of my major addictions, I should probably learn more about it. Anyway. Fruit forward, chocolate back. Okay. Um, so, if you uh, saw from the uh, title, the uh, it's there is no Q five, and that's obviously just a clever way of bringing us to the end of the year, and the idea that a lot of people don't necessarily plan; they get stuck, uh, as I said, getting hooked on hopium. We hope it will be different. We hope the next couple of weeks are going to be different. Maybe we hope next year will be different. Obviously, last um, December, we had no idea what the next 12 months were going to be leading up to. However, a lot of people will use that as an excuse to not have a plan. Some people think that planning is restrictive and can be really negative but there is actually a certain amount of freedom as a business owner. There's definitely a certain amount of emotional freedom from creating a plan. So uh, some wonderful quotes that I always loved about planning. First uh, from Abraham Lincoln, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. I myself and others that I know and that I've coached are guilty of getting out there with a dull ax and whacking away at the tree for six, maybe hours, not actually accomplishing the goal because I you know, would be very action oriented. And I want to do everything I can to um, uh, be active in a lot of cases that may not actually carry me towards my focused priority. So uh, that leads me to uh, the next quote. And I think actually there's some, um, uh, there's a couple here and there. 
I don't think they're attributed to anybody, so I, I don't want to take credit because I'm sure I heard them somewhere before. Uh, first is a plan without action is a daydream, and action without a plan is a nightmare. So a lot of times I want to get out there and do, 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 because, you know, I may be lost, but I'm making great time, uh, but I don't have a plan. So it's, you know, that does become a nightmare because I can, I can create a lot of wreckage. The daydream part of it is what I think a lot of people who have taken the leap into planning uh, actually uh, exhibit, which is that you make a plan and uh, it sits there or sits on the shelf and nothing comes of it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that today. When Jack Welch uh, actually came in and, um, and famously started cutting positions and, and different things within the company, he walked into the, the one room uh, within the organization that actually had all the three ring binders. And he said, what the heck is this? They said, those are all of our strategic plans and annual plans. And he said, uh, well, what are they doing? So well, this is where we store all of them after we finish them. And he said, okay, so well, you guys are gone. <laughs> he said, they get rid of all this because they weren't living, breathing documents, which is what's important. So um, uh, there is one thing I want to say that's a, aside from planning, and then I'm going to go through and give I think it's five main points to just running a, a plan. We are actually having a, a planning session with Action Coach Louisville on January 8th, and I'll make sure to post that on my LinkedIn and Facebook and whatever else. And uh, and that's great. And it's that's what we're talking about today is the importance of a plan. But if we look back a year ago and say, how could we have possibly known what was to come, what good would a plan have done me? right? That's usually a lot of the pushback we get from planning. So there's a, it was a great article in Harvard Business Review by Peter uh, Skoblik, and uh, it, it's, it's about scenario planning, okay, is what it's called. And I can't remember the name of the article itself. I probably should look it up specifically, but if you just search HBR and, and scenario planning, that'll be it, or shoot me a, a, a note or a message, and I'll uh, send you the information. Essentially, what you do is you look out into the future and you kind of come up with maybe some wacky scenarios, maybe some not so crazy scenarios, and you figure out essentially through these many different scenarios that you would put out there that would negatively affect the business, you know, it could have something to do with material costs, the mass, you know, wildfires, things like that. If you're, if you buy lumber and maybe, uh, you know, people uh, situations, people shortages when it comes to unemployment and things of that nature, obviously COVID could be one that you wouldn't name specifically COVID, but they give some great examples on how you can go through and get some good, uh, good scenarios. Anyway, what you do is you put these scenarios together and then you see as a solution what solution would have the most common impact across these various scenarios? Doesn't mean it would fix them, but if there are six independent scenarios that all share a geographic or logistical issue or a material issue that could at least be improved should it come about by the implementation of a system or a process, then you are much more likely to be able to season any of those situations as they may come up. So that's how, uh, one, that's one way for us to deal with these uh, unforeseen situations and instances and, and uh, catastrophic occurrences that will affect our business. So if you're that concerned, if you don't wanna make a plan because you're that concerned about all these crazy things happening, including COVID and whatnot, then that's actually not an excuse to not plan what you're actually doing is contradicting yourself in that and it's even more of a reason to plan specifically through scenario planning so and it's actually an entire field all unto itself which is very interesting to read the article um so okay the let's talk about making a plan so there are um there are some some steps i'd like to go through that are pretty simple and straightforward um but a lot of times they're skipped and these are it's something you can do I um, yourself. I obviously, as a coach, we definitely uh, support having a facilitator assisting with this process because the one of the biggest problems that business owners have is that they make stuff up and then they believe it, right? And then they act accordingly 
and they direct their people accordingly based on maybe an unfounded piece of information uh, that came about as a fact that they are maybe maybe untrusting of their people, maybe they don't know how to delegate properly, or maybe they're not really good at communicating their expectations and goals, and that will come out in the planning process. So always love to have facilitation, uh, facil uh, facilitators involved. It's one of the things that I loved my, when my dad and I worked together before this, we actually did that um, nationally for mechanical contractors and we would go in and do strategic planning, which was wonderful. The planning part is wonderful. The difficult part is the accountability on the back end. And we'll talk about that. So how do we start the process? So er, uh, get everybody in your uh, uh, company to get involved. That's one way. There can be solutions that come from frontline team members that you wouldn't expect to have a point of view. Remember your job as a business owner is to develop leaders in your company. And that's at all levels of leadership, okay? And empowering people. Uh, there was an airline, I'm gonna say, it, I think it was Delta, probably not. But it ended up rolling out to uh, the entire team about uh, cost-cutting measures and ideas for cost-cutting measures. And there was a, a pilot who uh, knew, doesn't know anything about business or planning necessarily, not nothing, but definitely wasn't formally trained and wasn't involved in that. He was a pilot. He was very good at what he did, which is the technical aspects of flying the plane. And what he realized is that if he changes his altitude to a certain altitude and, uh, and stays there instead of varying or, or um, maybe not focusing and staying on that altitude, sometimes, sometimes coming off of it. But if he stayed on that altitude, he would actually reduce the consumption of fuel by a significant percentage. And he thought, wow, if every single plane in the company did that, imagine how much we would save. Well, that idea, because it was presented to the entire team, rolled back up and they ended up saving millions upon millions of dollars in jet fuel because of that idea for the front line. So it's always a good idea to get the front line together. So number one, we've got to take an honest look at our current reality. The best map in the world is useless if you don't know where you are. So let's start with where we are. And that's where a lot of you are probably familiar with and have utilized the SWOT analysis, right? So the SWOT analysis strengths, weaknesses, um, uh, threats, and uh, opportunities is, is a, it's a, it's a half of an equation that I look at, right? So we do the SWOT analysis, we list all of those out. And then what we do is we do a toes analysis. So really tricky. So SWOT spelled backwards is toes, right? T-O-W-S. Essentially what you do is you take your SWOT analysis and you put it on a grid and you can find these online or message me and I can send you an example of one. But Essentially, what you do is you've got internal versus external factors when you're looking at, at your business today. So the internal factors are your strengths and your weaknesses, right? They're things that you can control more so. The external factors are the opportunities and the threats. Uh, so threats, I also, the, the T, I also like to call that truths because a lot of times, uh, like people would say, what's the, uh, the biggest threat to your business? Oh, it's the economy or it's Obama or it's Trump or whoever, uh, it, it may in fact be a threat, but if you look across your industry, a lot of those actually come out as truths because they affect everybody in the industry, not just your business. I really like to look a bit more at threats as something that can specifically affect your business only or your region, because then we can look at ways to deal with that. So. We had our SWOT analysis and we do our TOES analysis. So the TOES analysis, what we do is we utilize that to do a comparison. So we match up your strengths with your opportunities and we match up weaknesses and threats. And what we do is in there, we look at ways that we can reduce the threats because the threats that exist where we're weakest, we definitely want to avoid, okay? Um, or build up the weaknesses to deal with it if we can't avoid it. Uh, we want to take advantage of the opportunities, obviously, but we really want to exploit the strengths that we have that match up with those opportunities. So an opportunity can exist. It doesn't mean the company is uh, maybe best suited to actually take advantage of that opportunity. So there are different things that we can 
uh, look at when it comes to two different opportunities. If you have a strength that matches one over the other, that's the one you want to take advantage of. And then, of course, you know, remove the weaknesses, build the weaknesses up. That's something that we do so we can actually take advantage of not just listing a SWOT analysis, which I've seen people do where they put a SWOT analysis out. and Oh, there, there we go. There's our SWOT analysis. Where those are our strengths and there's our weakness. And it's just it, it's fine, but you don't do anything with it. Right. So that gives us our current reality of where we are and some opportunities ahead. So that's number one. So taking an honest look at your reality through a SWOT and toes analysis. Number two, do a year in review. Right. Take a look at the last 12 months and a couple things that we suggest people that people look at are. Number one, wins. Wins for you, wins from your team, wins from the company. And I'm sorry to say I don't ever let my clients get away with survival as a win. Right. Now, I'm not saying that people say, well, is it better to survive or die? Well, that's that's stupid. Of course, it's best to survive. But it's survival is a result of something, right? That's a result of specific actions you take within the business. You know, it may have been making difficult decisions about um, uh, cutting positions or cutting individuals. Um, and that would support, you know, that which I'm not saying that Cutting people's win, but being willing to make sacrifices for the company could be it. Maybe a win is that you decided to jump on the PPP as soon as it was available. Awesome. That's a great opportunity for you. Um, the uh, so, so we list out the wins for the year and have everybody do that. And then we list out the learnings. Now, here's something I got to say. Um, Pre-pandemic, most companies, well, every company in some way, shape, or form, but most companies that I work with had some glaring issues that we were dealing with that they allowed to happen, right? So with your people, you get what you tolerate. All of a sudden the pandemic comes, uh, you know, you get payroll slashed, you have to start making decisions on who you're gonna let go and who you're gonna keep. And you looked and realized that, oh, well, this person, uh, they're, not, they're really not uh, performing the way they should be. And they actually haven't been performing the way they should be for quite some time. I said, why does it take a pandemic to have you make a decision like this when you can honestly look back and know that you've been enabling them by keeping them on the payroll to continue to do what they've been doing. So, and I'm not just saying you slash and, and cut people and fire them, but if you have done everything you can from a developmental standpoint to try and actually empower that individual, train them and educate them, and they still are underperforming, well, we shouldn't have to wait for a pandemic for that to occur. So sometimes that's one of the learnings that we have when we look at the past. Another learning that we have a lot of times is when it comes to looking at financial documentation, like maybe not really understanding your financials or maybe you understand them, but you just don't make them part of the business. Like they're not part of the, the way the company operates. Um, and so what happens is a lot of times people will, um, make decisions that are a little bit unfounded just because they don't really know the numbers. They don't have an intimate, consistent knowledge of the numbers. Now with the pandemic coming, obviously people are looking at their numbers really close. So why would it take a pandemic for that to happen? So the learnings that we have a lot of times are these red flags or these things that we ignored in the past. We need to stop doing that now. Okay. So that can be a learning. Uh, mistakes are um, just, opportunities to learn in disguise, I guess is a way to say it. I mean, I don't really track mistakes unless it's something that happened again and again, you don't learn from them. So a lot of learnings are simply mistakes that you actually improved your business or yourself or your company from. Okay, that's number two. So that year in review, let's take a look at the past. We know we, as a friend of mine likes to say, we can shower in the past, but don't bathe in it, right? So we figure out what we learned, what our learnings were. Okay, number three, we figure out what our goals are for 2021. So we wanna be very specific sure you're aware of smart goals um, and specific measurable attainable results driven and timeline uh, time sensitive and there are obviously many different specific definitions for for what the uh, the letters stand for but in general it gives you a good plan beyond simply saying um uh oh we're gonna uh our goal for the year or goal, our goal is to hire uh, three new salespeople. okay well i have a big problem with that so if I, if I hire three salespeople, uh, one of them ends up really not living up to their resume uh, or their experience. Another one of them uh, ends up having a drug problem. And a third one uh, ends up extorting money from the company. 
but hey, you achieved your goal of hiring three salespeople, so good for you. That's obviously an extreme example, but it gets the point across. So the point is, what are the results that those three new salespeople are supposed to achieve? Or if you're sending people into training, what are the results of that training? You want to create a system or a process and all of these things that are kind of like branding to marketing, they're immeasurable, right? So what are the things that these are supposed to affect? That's got to be the goal, right? That's got to be the focus and what we're looking at to move towards. That's what a specific goal is. So at the end of the year, we can actually point and say we move the needle at, past, or below where we expected to, but we can measure that very specifically. So those are the annual goals. Then from that point, so that's number three, right? Number four is where we actually take those and break them down into quarterly goals. Not all quarters are created equal, so sometimes we're going to have to take some goals and we're going to have to adjust them. You don't just take a financial goal for the year and divide it by four. Please don't do that. And if you're doing a cash flow budget, which everybody should be doing, again, that's one of those things people didn't like, didn't feel they needed to do before the pandemic, but now they have to. Um, that's one of those things that you can't just divide by 12, you know, cash flow budget. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are accounting for the season, that we're accounting for uh, the regular flow of business, and, um, you know, even as far as holidays are concerned. So um, it's very important to take a look at the full scope of the situation before we make specific goals, because we don't really like to change those goals if we can but no budget's going to be perfect. So we have to understand that, but at least make a stab on it. Okay, so um, we'll get to, to point number five in a minute. I just want to run through these real quick. Again, number one, take an honest look at the company through a SWOT analysis and TOES analysis. Number two, year in review, wins, learnings. Number three, annual goals. Number four, quarterly goals, specifically Q1 goals. Okay, now number five, Foster, we've done this planning thing before. Great. What's the problem? Oh, the problem is, <clears throat> which is kind of, we don't, it, it, it's, it's good for the first couple months. Uh, and then what happens? Well, it's a great question. So uh, uh, John Maxwell has a wonderful quote that says, he says, the decision to do something is nowhere near as important as the management of that decision. Okay, if you want an example of this in your own life, uh, raise your hand. Matt Greenberg, thanks for showing up, man. Uh, hopefully you have a great Friday. Great to have you on here, buddy. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever joined a gym in January. Wow, okay, I have. And you know what ends up happening? And I'll be honest with you, I'm doing this right now with the pandemic. I'm kind of stuck with my, with my gym, which I absolutely love, Iron Tribe. But I'm just stuck with the pandemic. So I'm currently donating to the gym right? Most gyms, they cannot survive if everybody who signed up actually went. I mean, just logistically, internally, there would be not enough equipment. Externally, there wouldn't be enough parking spaces, etc. So that's a decision people make without the proper management of the decision. So the decision to do a plan and create a plan, the decision to come up with goals, those things are decisions, but we have to figure out a way to manage them. So the way we do that is we take a goal, one of the goals that we established for the year and the quarter, <clears throat> we have to assign a champion to the goal. Who is in charge of this goal? You have to have one person who's in charge of this goal. It doesn't mean it's the only person who works on it. It just means it's the one person who's responsible for it. Then within that, we have to create strategies or tactics or objectives, whatever you want to call them. These are specific things that need to be done in order to achieve the goal. So if it's a revenue growth, Maybe hiring three salespeople is part of that. That would be a tactic, right, or a strategy. And so what we need to have then is we need to have um, assignments for very specific uh, tactics or strategies that we're going to be initiating, these action steps to support the goal. And we have to have deadlines, right? When are, we, when are you going to finish this? And don't make them too big, right? Everybody knows how to, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Don't, it, don't just put out a deadline. When is this going to be done? In two months, great. There's got to be some intermediary benchmarking deadlines within there. If not, by the time you get close to the end, if there is a problem, it's going to be so out of whack that it, you're not going to be able to correct it in time, right? Just, it's not going to make sense. So we want to be able to benchmark these with some smaller goals 
that are cut down and benchmarked up front. So the last part of this is the accountability. Okay, the example with uh, uh, Jack Welch and having all of the plans up, uh, you know, on the shelves, they have to be a living, breathing document. So at bare minimum, you have to pull your plan out and look at it on a monthly basis, bare minimum. Where are we? What do we need to do? What's our focus? In a lot of cases, you probably want to do it on a weekly basis to at least touch base, depending on the size of the initiatives and the things that need to be done. Uh, you don't want people to get bored with, um, you know, looking at it every single week when you know you're not going to have um, enough motion on these things, even if you chunk down the goal, the, the sub goals. If you, if you chunk down those tactics, you may just be repeating yourself week after week, but I'd rather you do that and have it out in front of you than have it lost, right? So um, so this next year, I'm, I'm doing this early. I'm actually not gonna be doing one next week for Christmas day, uh, but I'm talking about this early for a couple of reasons. And mainly it's because uh, I'd rather you have a plan and not use it or not be able to use it because of the current situation um, or not be able to use all of it in its exact iteration, then not have a plan at all. Because, oh, things are just so up in the air, we can't expect anything, this is a waste of time because everything's going to change, da 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 And so uh, I just want you to think your way through that. I'm happy to help. You can reach out to me any way that I can assist with this process. It, it was never something I ever did or enjoyed doing and still I, until I started doing it for my clients. Then it really became... Uh, dare I say, a fun process <laughs> to go through. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for a lot of people, simply having a plan to kind of fall back on or depend on is a, a way that you can reduce emotional stress, especially with everything that's going on during this pandemic and the stressors that are already out there, right? Um, there's a lot of, it's just the difference in lifestyle now for a lot of people. I think, you know, for us, we're staying in house, but we're, we're comfortable. We have food, we have everything we need. So it's not horrible, but it is a shift and a change for a lot of people. And so taking that into consideration, there's enough stress in people's lives that are going on right now. We don't want to add to that. So one way we can reduce that stress is to get a plan together. So, um, without further ado, uh, Merry Christmas. And I will actually be, um, uh, coming to you on new year's day. So January 1st is a Friday. So maybe that would be like a F FWF would be the first Friday with Foster, the first Friday of the year. Uh, anyway, I'll try and come up with something that sounds clever. But uh, I hope you have a wonderful time with your family. Um, happy Hanukkah. Uh, happy Kwanzaa. Merry Christmas. Happy Festivus. Uh, just be kind to each other. Uh, be kind to yourselves and uh, look forward to uh, more videos, more coffee. Have a great day.